pray it's recording this screen. You can never tell what screen it's recording. Okay, so let me go ahead and uh, share my screen. This one, bang, then we'll just get started. Okay, everybody, sit back, hold tight. Um, here we go. So today's is oh, actually let me get the hand. What did I? I gotta get to the chat of this in case any of you guys have questions while I talk. There's the controls. There's the controls. Hang on, I want to make sure I'm recording the right screen. Hmm. Okay. Well, I hope. <clears throat> All right, we're good to go. Okay, cool. All right, um, HTML, CSS. This is the meat and bones of what a website's made out of. All right, here we go. Okay, first we're gonna talk about HTML, right? I'm sure everyone probably knows what this is. Um, stands for Hypertext Markup Language. And it is, it was created by our Lord and Savior, Tim Berners-Lee, um, in 1990, while he was working at CERN. Um, he also wrote the first browser, um, and it was originally meant, HTML was originally meant to share documents among peers. Now, if you can imagine, right, two scientists, I guess, you know, wanting to share their research papers, um, they'd have to physically send their papers to each other, right? Or um, I'm not entirely sure if email was around at this point, so I can't even say to that, but Tim Berners-Lee came up with HTML. And if, as we go through this, if you know HTML, it's written to look like a Word document, essentially, right? The headers, the paragraphs, um, it's all meant to represent parts of a document. In fact, that's what you call the HTML, it's your document. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, so um, I actually have a link. I'll pull it up. I'll, I'll slide the screen over. But this is what the act. This is what the first, uh, in uh, the first web page looked like. The first website. So you can kind of see pretty much what it looked like. You guys can see my screen, right? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Yes. Uh, yeah. So this is what it looked like. Um, it almost looks more like a like a Windows application in a sense like an old Windows application, but that's what it looked like. Um, I'll have this link up somewhere when I post this with this video. Um, yeah, that's what it looked like. Anyway, um, okay. Let's go ahead and let's break down what HTML means, right? The first part of HTML is hypertext, right? What is hypertext? Hypertext is the text which is not constrained to be linear, meaning it can contain links to other texts, right? So it's not just like this page, this page, this page, but it's like this page and it's linked to this page, which is linked to this page, right? And hyperlinks are a perfect example of, of hypertext. It's kind of hard to read. Was the, was the site hard to read or is the the oh the website yeah it's little i can zoom in if you guys want to see what it looks like again hang on i can zoom in i think there you go yeah there it is yeah it's crazy <laughs> okay anyway enough with this you can i'll link it so you guys can play with it um cool 
Next one of hypertext of HTML is the markup. What is markup? Um, markup refers to the sequence of characters or other symbols that you insert at certain places in a text or word file to indicate how the file should be looked when it's displayed or shown. Um, and it also describes its own logical structure. Um, HTML is not the only markup language there is. There's also XML um, and a few other ones, but basically markup is just a fancy way of saying that the, the code like describes itself. All right, so like, for example, if you know the header navigation or the header element that is describing itself, right? It's like, I am the header, this is what I do kind of thing. Um, that's kind of what makes markup different than just saying, hey, this text is supposed to represent this, like the actual code tells what it's supposed to do. Um, yeah. And what does HTML do? Um, well, it describes how a web page should look and be structured based on a set of predefined elements or tags, which most people call, I mean, tags, elements, uh, which one do I hear more? Probably tags, I think, just because it's easier to, shorter to say. Um, and as we keep going, we're gonna actually gonna build an HTML document and kind of break it down and show you how it, how it all pieces together. Um, so how does the HTML get turned into a web page? We kind of discussed this last week, but I have a different image that's gonna show you. Um, and it's done by the browser. So here we have, um, you start over on the left and the a web page is queried by the browser. It first cache, checks your cache. We talked about this two weeks ago when we did this. It uh, checks your cache to see if you've been to this website before. If not, it goes to the DNS server, which then translates your URL into an IP address. Then the server, the, the, then your browser then gets the get request from the server. You can forget about this yellowy orange part. I actually had that blocked out in my thing, but it, it didn't block it out here. So I don't know why it's not showing it. But anyway, um, and the web page is served over port 80, which is the default HTTP server port. We talked about this two weeks ago. And then it sends you back a 200 response, which is an okay response and actually sends you back the document you requested. Um, there's a lot more that goes into this behind the scenes. Like, obviously you don't have to have it as port 80. Um, you do, there's different ports for like HTTPS. Um, you can send back a different response code other than 200, um, since you can fully control what the server does if you, you know, if you have it. Um, but just by going to like facebook.com, google.com, HTTP, kingattest.wordpress.com, like this says, you're going to be served the, um, oh, look at that. Oh, that's what I did. Oh, okay. I see what I did there. Sorry. You're going to be served the index page. All right. By default, by typing in the browser, google.com, you are served up the index page. Um, index.html is what it's called. Historically, you could also do index.htm, but I think that was really meant only for like, um, Windows server, like IIS servers. Um, but I think everyone is pretty much stuck to index.html. Um, you can have a different page brought back to you. Um, but like I said, that's kind of server configuration and that is not in the scope of this talk. Um, any questions so far? I have a question for from the slide from the slide guys before this one. Yeah. Uh, I guess without the red square. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is the self surf let? The HTTP. Uh, see, this I don't know. That's why I, I blocked it out. I think it might have to do is like um, I don't know Java. It might have to. It might be a Java thing. Yeah, okay. that's what I thought. A Java. Yeah. Um, I think it has to do with Java's. Uh, rendering the web page and then sending it back to you like building the the yeah i don't know what java servlets are i think they like they, they're like little they build web pages dynamically and then send it back to you um but okay. like I, I don't know so that's what that is that's why i blocked it out because i knew okay cool just curious yeah Thanks. yeah 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 um i probably should learn java it's like the next natural language i think i should 
like in my line of learning languages, um, but I just chose not to. All right, so we kind of talked about this again before, what um, extensions the browsers can handle. They obviously HTML is what they can um, handle the most, but um, images such as PNG, JPEG, and um, okay, GIF or GIF, however you want to say it. Um, they can also render text, PDFs, audio and video files of varying formats. Um, these are just a couple of them. Um, so obviously these audios and videos, you can load them directly in the audio or video tag, um, but you can also just browse to your file on your computer and play them. I'm like 99% sure, I've never, I've never done it, but based on what I feel like it should do, like when it came with PDFs, it can do the same thing with audio and video files. Like you can just play it. Um, all right, parts of the document. This is gonna be, this is kind of where we're getting into the meat and bones of what the document is. Um, first thing we have is the doc type. Um, here I listed four of them. The top one, the HTML5 one is probably what you're gonna use in your like forever for at least until they come up with like an HTML6 or something. But um, in the past, they've had 4.01 to strict to just transitional and frame set. Each one of these is different in their own way of how they're forcing the browser to handle the HTML. But essentially what this does is it tells the browser, hey, I am an HTML document, be prepared for like to render HTML. Um, and each one of these older ones, these 4.01s, um, had it done a little bit differently. Like I think strict meant like your input tags had to be closed properly, whereas traditional, you didn't have to. It was a little bit more relaxed as to what you can and can't do. Um, but HTML5 is the standard now, and it's written like this. Um, we call it bang, doc type, HTML, right? And then boom, we're going to create a document so you guys can kind of see what it looks like, and that's what you would put. Next part is your HTML tag. Um, just like all tags, except for a handful of them, um, you have to open and close them and it begins with HTML ends with slash HTML. And it tells the browser where your HTML starts, right? Where it needs to start looking for HTML. And so we're going to put that in our page. Um, the next part is the head of the document. Now the head is special in that the only part of the head that is visible to the web page is your title tag. Um, and that title is what is on like Google search results. It's what appears when you bookmark a page. Um, but in the head, um, obviously begins and ends with head. Um, meta stuff goes here, like character sets, names, descriptions. Um, you would put your style tags here for your CSS. Um, any sort of links out to other stuff. Um, your JavaScript can go here. And I put JavaScript here because I think a lot of people, when they learn JavaScript, has you link them in the head, but as you get into JavaScript, you'll realize that you're probably better off loading your JavaScript at the bottom of the HTML page after the document is loaded. So you have access to all your DOM elements when the JavaScript becomes available. But for the sake of this, JavaScript also can be put in your head. Um, yeah. So we're gonna put it there. So in the head, I put here a meta tag with the character telling the browser the character set we're using is UTF-8. Um, and that the title is beginning web development. So if I were to, if this was an actual web page and I bookmarked it, yeah, I would see beginning web development. Jude, you got a question? Yeah, I have a question about JavaScript in the head. Um, yeah. I heard that putting it at the bottom was kind of like a hack and to um like the the normal way to do it would be to put it in the head and use defer is sure. that something you do? yeah you could do that is it is there really a difference though no um i do have to say though i don't i saw an awesome animation on the differences between defer and async i think there's an async tag you could do too um it depends. And I'm only saying it depends because I'm not 100% sure. So if someone else knows, they can you know, chime in. But the problem with putting it in the head of your document is a lot of times you're trying to, it's not that you're trying to, there's a couple of issues. One, it stops your HTML from loading because it's got to load the JavaScript. So you lose, a, like the, the user, when they hit your web page, has that little bit of like 
waiting for the JavaScript to load before anything renders to the screen, right? So immediately putting it at the bottom of the page is going to stop that from happening. Um, secondly, if you're trying to get something out of your, you know, your HTML using JavaScript and you're doing it in the head of your page, the browser, you know, runs from the top down. When it gets to your JavaScript, it's going to go through your JavaScript before it comes back to your HTML and keeps going. So if you're trying to query something out of your document that isn't there yet because you haven't let the browser render it, then it's not going to work, right? So putting it at the bottom of the page also solves that. Now, if you put it as defer, I don't know if it like waits to even run until the browser is done rendering, or you still need to maybe put in like a document dot on load handler, you know, like so you wait for the, the body to load. I don't know. I haven't tested it around like that, but um, that could be something interesting to go over at some point. Yeah. Yeah. I will try to find the animation I found of the differences between async scripts are executed as soon as the script is loaded. So it doesn't guarantee the color order of execution. Defer script guarantees the order of execution in which they appear in the page. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that this still doesn't like answer. Does the JavaScript run as soon as it's found then? Or you're saying it's or executed as soon as the script is loaded, which that is bad because then you want the JavaScript to wait to the DOM loads. Defer scripts guarantees the order of execution in which they appear on the page, which is still bad because you want the, the JavaScript to run after. Yeah, that's also jQuery too, which is a little bit different than JavaScript because. Anyway, we'll keep going. Yeah, we'll keep going. Um, for those watching the video, I'll place this here so people can see uh, what we're talking about. Um, I feel like I'm talking in this text in this video and I gotta kind of think of people actually watching it maybe in the future, having no idea what we're talking about. Um, yeah, so I'll leave this here for a second so people can like pause the video or something. All right, bring it back. Um, okay, cool, we'll keep going. Does that, does that answer your question, Jude? Is that sufficient for now? Yeah, that's good. Okay. Um, the next part, most important part, some might argue, is the body. And this is the actual visible part of your web page. This is what actually is rendered to the website um, and what people will most likely be interacting with. And so out of everything that we've done, there's our full HTML document at its basic core. I mean, even more basic than this is you can remove the meta tag. You don't even need a title. Um, and you don't even need the attribute language equals en here. Um, in fact, you might even be able to go without an HTML, the body and the head and the browser just won't render anything. But for what we're going to go with and probably from what you're going to do in the future developing, this is the core of what you're using. All right, we keep talking about the document, the DOM. I think I've mentioned it a couple of times. What is the DOM? The DOM is the document object model. When I first started learning HTML, this was kind of the hardest part for me to understand of exactly what it was. Um, but essentially it's a tree-like structure um, that represents sort of like the hierarchy of all your elements and tags. Um, it, the, you can essentially kind of think of it like the browser creates this sort of virtual tree of all your code. And uh, you know, I'm sure all of us as we code, tab in our, you know, any child elements from the parent so we can kind of visibly see what sits inside the parent. I imagine that's kind of like how the browser sees it as well. They kind of like create this sort of like the tab kind of is like a child node and it keeps creating all these trees. Um, but it's, it's more than just your tags in the document object model, which is very crucial to understand. It's, it is a reference to eat like, it is a reference to each element, but each element has things belonging to it, like all its attributes that, it, that it's capable of, like JavaScript, all its handlers that you could put on JavaScript, like the document object model. Like the, if you were to reference this P tag here in the DOM, it is aware of its width and height. It's aware of what its parent is. It's aware of what its child's are. Children are child's. <laughs> it's aware of like a sibling element. So. The document object model is not just like a list of all oh, this goes here and this is goes here like it is like each element is aware of its surrounding elements so it's a little bit deeper than just a tree which is cool and and you'll you can see this when you get into javascript and you actually have to 
grab something out of the dom and look at it and you're like wow there's all these things here that you know i didn't even know existed um so the next important part to know when you're dealing with html elements is whether they're block versus inline um and um we're not talking about flexbox we're just talking about straight elements but um <clears throat> You can kind of think of a web page as blocks of elements stacked on top of each other. Now, some elements can sit next to each other. Some elements can sit below each other. So, you know, you can have one big element here with like three small ones on the side. Um, kind of think of maybe like Legos, right? Um, and to make that structure at the very core, there's two ways, you, there's two, um, displays i guess you can kind of go with in the beginning before you learn flex which is block and inline and block level elements naturally take up the entire width of their parent all right they will render 100 percent width of their parent okay they they will start on a new line and they will render the 100 percent width of their parent i'm saying this three times because it's important to know that um the block elements can contain other block level as well as inline level elements um and by default they begin on new lines and they kind of used to create like larger structures kind of like a you know this i'm blocking this page out like the sections of the page to, to kind of mean something and here's an example of some block level elements paragraph tag you know if you throw three p tags in a row they're going to render on the screen one below each other same as all the h one all the h's um, the unordered list, the, or, the ordered list, the pre address. I mean, I'm not going to list all of them, but you can see that each one of these is a block level element. So throw it in there. The form was what surprised me as being block level. If you put a form element, it naturally spans the whole width of the parent, which sometimes the parent is the, the web page that is the actual like body. So sometimes their width is the, <laughs> the width of your website. Um, the next one is your inline elements, which do not span the full width. They only take up the amount of space needed by what's inside. Um, it could contain data like like straight text, you know, and other inline elements. It is bad code to put a block level element in an inline level element. There's nothing stopping you. The browser's going to render it probably like you think it should, but it is not good code to do that. Um, by default, inline elements do not begin on new lines. They will sit side by side until they come to the edge of the screen when they will wrap around again. Um, and inline elements create shorter structures than block level elements. Um, and here are some examples. The B tag, which is bold. Oops. The I tag, which is italicized. Um, you really don't use those too much because that's considered styling. And you pretty much leave that up to CSS. You will go over that later. Um, image tag some of these popular ones image um span the button the input the label the slug the text area all those are in line so if you wanted them to be the full width of the page a couple of things you could do you could go to css and you could force them to be 100 percent width you can also set their display to be block and force them to act like a block level element um i have to i've had I have done that a few times with inputs where you've wanted the input to sort of be 100% width of its parent, and then you just control the parent element. Um, so just an example. All right, I talked about an attribute earlier. Oh, Linda, what's up? You got a question? Okay, this may be a dumb question. Never. But how would you know if it's a block a level element when you're doing it as opposed to an inline until so, you get everything out and you go and look at it when it's live so yeah okay guess a good question um the elements themselves are naturally block or inline for example as you see in the when i end this block page i have up these elements at the bottom are block level by default and there's not that many of them that do that. Um, and if you, and then here are some inline level elements, right? So they are inline by default. And if you did, if you don't know, right, you could Google if it's block or level inline, 
or you could put it on the page. And if it appears next to the element above it, um, then above it, meaning like in your code, not like on the web page. You know, if you put a p tag, mm -hmm. and then and then in your code underneath it, you put a span, and you look on the web page, and you notice that your span element is sitting below your p tag. Well, one of them is a block, right? And in this case, it's your p tag, which takes up 100% width. So it's like no one sits next to me, right? So it's going to force the next element to show up underneath. Um, okay. Yeah, it's kind of a weird concept to understand, but the the elements themselves are naturally block or inline by, by okay. default. And so you can just go, you can Google what are block level elements and it'll list out all the block level. And you're like, okay, well, I want to use this one. Um, you'll, we'll, we'll talk about this maybe a little bit more when we get into like semantic coding um, because maybe understanding the semantics of how to, how to write the code might make more sense. Okay. Okay, Brian, I see you have your hand up. I don't know how okay. long you've had it up. I just noticed it. Yeah, I mean, what, what's a good use for a span element? So, okay, span element is typically used for, uh, a lot of times you need to maybe, you wanna make the text in the middle of a sentence be blue and the rest of the text around the sentence be red. The only way to do that is to throw a span right there and maybe give it a class or something, you know? Um, you could, I mean, honestly, that's really it. It's, you, I've really only ever used spans when I needed to style something a little bit different than what the what his parent was getting. Um, it doesn't add anything to the browser. It doesn't add any styling, like P tags, they add margins above and below, right? So spans don't do anything. They don't add any sort of styling to, the, to your element naturally. Um, that's just one use case. So you're just good for like putting an ID tag, I mean, an ID on there or a class on there. Yeah, for the most part. They, yeah, just like a div. Span and divs are like, I think of them as like brother and sister or brothers, I guess. Divs are the exact same thing as spans, but as block level, right? divs, you know, short for like dividers or divisions, they're meant to logically divide up parts of your code. Um, but a lot of people start what doing what we call div soup, which is you do use divs for everything. Um, and like, that is not the semantic way to go. And we'll talk about that a little later. And so sometimes in your, you know, in your div, you might want to style like this thing differently, like this one text where maybe you want to like bold it. Well, you can use the B tag, absolutely, but we'll talk about this a little later. You want to separate your concerns. And the B tag for bold actually is like a styling, right? It'll style, the, it'll bold the text. And you want to keep your styling out of your HTML and in CSS because in the, it's easier to develop. So you put a span there, give it a class of maybe like bold, you call it, and then you just, you know, make the bold class bold at whatever elements it's attached to. Okay. You know, so yeah, it's it's versatile, but it's easily both of them are versatile, but they're easily um, overused. overused. Yeah, yeah, overused. Yeah, and we'll talk about this a little later. Sometimes you can't get over using multiple divs because sometimes it just makes sense to separate things out like that. But we'll we'll go over it a little bit. Um, is that good? Cool. Yep. yep. Thanks. Cool. Attributes. All right. So. We talked about the tags and all HTML elements are able to have attributes. Some attributes only work with certain elements. So here are a couple of attributes. The ID class, a lot of you probably know source works with um, images. I think even videos and audio. Um, action only works on forms. Method only works on forms. Um, width, height, rows, col rows, columns only work on text areas. Um, and I, there's one from earlier, I'll go back a little bit, kind of throw it up here. This one, language, lang equals en. Lang is the attribute, en is the value, and it's on the HTML tag. So it tells the HTML that, hey, this language is in English. So if you're doing something with accessibility that needs to read it or you know, something like that, it tells the browser that you're dealing with English text in your, in your page. Not that your code is written in English, <laughs> but like your, the text in your, in your website is English. 
go back. All right, so we'll see more um, attributes here in a little bit. Um, elements, um, most popular one by far, the div. The, I'm just gonna go over a couple of elements with what we're doing right now. Um, most popular one is the div. It defines division or a section in an HTML document. It does not add any padding or margin, right? You're gonna find out as you code and write your HTML that some elements provide padding and margins for you without just off the bat, just because you use them, right? And a lot of times you might not want that. So sometimes you have to override what the browser's default padding and margin is so you can make it look like how you want. Um, um, and if you ever come across this in the future, um, the pro it's called normalizing. By default, some browsers, maybe even all browsers, put a padding like on all four sides of your web page. And a lot of times you just have to override that and set your body to have a padding of zero or a margin of zero. Um, but the normalization in HTML is the practice of like overriding the browser's defaults so that you can start putting your own defaults in because some browsers will render things a little bit differently like Safari and Chrome, I think render things slightly different. Um, so <clears throat> the P tag, both of these are block level, div and P are block. Um, P defines a paragraph. Remember we talked about how when HTML was created, it was meant to look like a, like a word document. Well, this is essentially the P uh, paragraph. You, wrote, you go to paragraph, you, know, you go to word and write a paragraph. That's kind of like you can imagine what you're doing here. Um, it adds margins to the top and bottom of about 16 pixels, depending on the browser. Um, a lot of times I don't want margins at the top of my P tag for some reason. Maybe I wanted to sit closer to the element above it and I have to override that 16 pixels, you know, or maybe I don't want 16 pixels at all. I may want it only be eight from this point going forward. And there's ways you can style your code to only have all margins be eight on paragraphs. <clears throat> we can talk about that later too. The span tag, like you asked, uh, Brian, um, it's used to group inline elements, um, does not add any padding or margin, just like a div. Um, I mean, I've never heard of span soup. Um, I've only ever heard of div soup, but I guess you could have span soup if you went crazy like that. Um, a table tag defines a table. Um, it contain, tables contain one or more table row, which is a TR, table headers, and table data. Um, elements does not add padding or margin. So here's an example of what a table structure looks like. You have your table tag, opening, closed. Inside, you have your row, TR. So you're defining a row. And then your TD is defining a like a cell in that row. So this is a literally a table with like one row and one column, right? Um, in the early days of web development, entire websites were laid out in a table to get this, to get like something, to get a specific look, you know, cause maybe you couldn't achieve that look easily with CSS. A lot of times web pages were like one big giant like table within a table within a table, just so that it can achieve a certain look. Um, Linda, with, you have your hand raised. Would there be a table column for if you have like columns? Um, no, TR is the row. So it's defined in rows. And then you kind of say what's in each row, like what the column is in each row. And okay. then below it, you'd have a sec, like another TR. And then okay. theoretically, you would have the same number of TDs in the second row as you would the first one to match up. Um, it could get pretty cumbersome if you have a lot of data to display which... i'm just thinking like if you had like a um newsletter that you were doing and that's a two column spread like one oh, column yeah, like and then side, it side. rows over right side yeah, well, by that, side two column well it, that i mean to, to achieve that you know there's a couple of things if you're if it was like if the whole web page was like a left column and a right column to represent something, I probably wouldn't use a table for that. I'd probably use two, you know, elements sitting side by side with a width okay, of so fifty percent. You know what I mean? We set that up in CSS then. 
not in HTML. Right. I, I if in my so in my mind, you wouldn't use a table to to lay out your web page, which is what it sounds like you're trying to do. You would use a table to display data in a table, which is what it's meant yeah. for. Yeah. The, what you're what you're trying to achieve can be achieved by laying two elements side by side on the web page. Now, whether that's two divs or two section tags, I mean, section you probably wouldn't use because I don't think it's semantically correct here. I would probably just use divs, but you'd have a div here, a div here. Now, the problem that you're going to face is divs are block and they won't sit side by side by nature. So you would make each div be in line. You would go into CSS and say, you know, div, you know, display equals inline. Um, that way you could have them sit side by side and you can give the width of each div 50%. Now you have two divs that are half the size of your website or whatever it sits in, right? Whatever the parent it sits in. Okay. You might ask, you might ask why force a div to be inline rather than just use an inline element. And the reason I say that is because it's not good practice to put block level elements in inline elements. So I'm almost guaranteed that in your div, you would have other block level elements, like maybe paragraph tags. And so you, yeah. wouldn't, you wouldn't ever put a paragraph tag in a span. You would put it in the div pretending to be inline. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, table so data. Just, Thanks. Just to... seeing how you had these TRs laid out, I wasn't sure if there would be one for columns. So, T, yeah, so TR, yeah, so TR represents the row, and TD represents mm -hmm. like a cell in that row. And so the TD, I guess you could think of it, is the column. Um, and I didn't put this in, I probably should have, but you would also have a TH, which is like the row that's your header. And by default, the browser will will bold those those texts in each one of those TDs. So we can go away. I can give it like if you want later, we can um, after this, I can live code if you want me to show you what it would look like. Um, no, that's OK. We'll, okay. we'll probably get there in later. Sure. Maybe. Yeah. When we start implementing it. Yeah. All right. The next one is the A tag. Um, this is what links all websites together, defines a hyperlink. Um, it styles the text blue with an underline by default. If you've never been, unless you've been to the website before, then it'll be purple. But by default, the text is blue. And this is what it looks like. You have an A tag. Um, href is the name of the attribute. Um, it's something reference. I don't know what the H stands for. I probably should have looked that up, but um, <clears throat> Then you then you put an equal sign and then quote and then the like where you want that link to go to, and then once you've set that up in between your opening and closing a tag, that the, the word Google would be the text that is shown on the screen to people to click. So the word Google would be the one that's blue with an underline, and when you clicked it, it would go to Google.com. The next one, probably the next most important HTML element, is the form element. Um, this is as probably as close to, um, what am I trying to say? It's is probably as close to functional programming in HTML without having to write any programming like JavaScript. Um, it creates a form for the user <clears throat> and it can contain inputs, selects, buttons, labels, text areas. Just to be clear though, inputs, selects, buttons, labels, text areas, they don't have to go on a form. But when they are inside of a form element and they, they, they work together, sort of like Captain Planet, right? Um, each one of those is different. Earth, fire, wind, water, heart, right? They all work together and form would be Captain Planet. Um, <clears throat> and um, I'm going to try to say here, what's the thing? Um, the action element, I'm sorry, the action attribute is where the form gets submitted to. Now, form is a, the forms are a little bit harder to comprehend in the fact that like a lot of times people aren't fully comprehending what exactly the form is capable of. And the form is capable of doing a lot. Um, once you type in, like for example, you go to Facebook and you log in, you type in your username, you type in your password, 
um, you hit the click the submit button, a form when when submitted via like the submit button will take the values out of all the inputs from within the form and will send it to the endpoint um, labeled by the action attribute, right? So here it'll send this value to google.com. Google.com is not going to consume it at all. It has no idea what you're sending it, but for the sake of this, you know, example, that's what I put here. And um, the form is going to use the method post, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago, you know, post, put, patch, get. Um, post is the one people use most often here. So this is going to send a post request to google.com upon hitting the submit button, and it's going to send in the text and the password, whatever's in those inputs. And you don't have to do anything other than that is just write this out and you get that functionality right out of the box. I think people kind of have a hard time grasping. HTML has been sort of this, I put it on the screen and I see it, but now the form is like, okay, but now you see it, but now I can like send the data. And now we're going to actually like be using the internet for like, other than just displaying the web page. Um, <clears throat> now inside forms, you have inputs. Um, it defines a field where the user can put in data, does not need to be closed. As you can see, my input here is not closed. I put close, okay. I, um, I put a slash here at the end of this input to let you know that like historically, um, people put slashes at the end of their input tags to let you know that it was finished. You don't have to put them there nowadays. Um, but it's a good habit to get into to maybe do it because some people might like recognize this still. Um, but anyway, input tags don't have to be closed as in they don't have to have a slash input tag afterwards. Um, and there are a bunch of different kind of inputs, text, email, number, color picker, range, date, URL, password, submit. And each one of these, this is where the difference in browsers come into play. If you were to do a input type of number, uh, the browser is going to render an up and down arrow on the right side of the input to let you click up and down the number. In Safari, that up and down buttons are going to be des like designed differently than in Chrome. It's going to look like an Apple input with buttons, right? So that's where you kind of have to remember I'm dealing with, you know, are my users in Safari, are my users in Chrome? You know, I don't know if you can force that to look differently. I've never actually tried to force the up and down arrows to look different, um, but that's just an example. Email, um, the email input will throw an error in the form if the email that they've typed in is not in the correct format. So you kind of get, the email acts just like a text input, but you get a little bit of email validation with it as well. So if, you, if I put in the wrong email, not, not, not like the email doesn't exist, but like it's not in the right format, then um, your form will not submit and the browser will throw up an error at the top of the page that says, you know, invalid value in your email or whatever. The color picker is kind of cool. I don't think a lot of people realize this exists, but basically you get a free color picker by using this. Um, you also get range, like an input type of range. So you can select like a slider. A date input, you click it, you know, you get a calendar that pops up and you can select a date. URL works the same as email. It will, um, you know, validate the URL against like it being a valid format. Password will hide the text in the, in the you know, you've worked with this, a lot of people, you do this every day, but the password input will, you know, dot or asterisk the text so you can't see it. And then the submit input actually is a little bit different than the rest because it's actually a button. It's not even like an input. Um, it's just a button. And that is also going to look like what the browser says it is. Like in, in Safari, it's going to look differently than it is in Chrome. So a lot of times to get around that, people don't use the submit button. They use a button tag as the submit button because you can style that easier than a submit button and you have a little bit more leeway with what you can do with it. Um, okay, any questions so far? We're probably a third of the way done. This is, a, a, this is the long, we'll go through. 
If you have no questions, we'll just keep going. The next area we're gonna talk about is semantics, right? Now, what is semantics? Well, semantic elements clearly, des uh, clearly describe its meaning to both the browser and the developer. Here are some semantic elements. The header tag, right? Clearly tells us what it is, it's a header. The nav element tells us it's the nav. Footer, section, article, figure, aside, each one of those means something to the browser. And it's not just to the browser that you get this benefit from. And I'm gonna give you a, a pick, an example of what like, we talked about this div soup. On the left-hand side is the same layout as the right-hand side, except you use divs, <clears throat> right? That's div soup. The top is acting as a header, and you should put it in a header tag, right? The middle section is your article, right? Act, think of a newspaper, I guess. Um, and then if you have an image, don't wrap it in a div, maybe put it in a figure, um, and then you have your footer. The reason why you do this, you, there's some natural benefits of using semantics, okay? Rather than just using div soup. Um, benefits. SEO, search engine optimization, right? Google will rate your web page based on its semantics. All right. If it has poor semantics, it will rate lower than the same website with better semantics. 100%. That's like common knowledge in the web development industry. Um, accessibility. People who have yeah. accessibility is a huge thing in and of itself, right? It is a little bit scary when you, when you like, you find out about it that like you put a web page out on the internet and it is not accessible to people with disabilities, like people who are blind, who may need screen readers, you know, people who may not have a mouse and might have to use keyboards. Um, they can actually sue you for not being able to use your website as a normal person could. Normal as in like non-handicapped. I don't mean to sound harsh to say that people with disabilities are not normal. Um, I wonder if I can cut that out. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, so having semantic markup will allow the screen readers, people, you know, whatever technology they're using to manipulate your website, it'll allow them to do that easier, um, which is better for you. Because if it's a, if you have a website where you're trying to sell a product, you want people to buy stuff. You don't want them to have a difficult time navigating your website. Um, and the last thing is maintenance. It is much cleaner to look at someone else's code and know that it's a header when you're using the header tag. You, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've went back to a six month, one year old project I was working on and realized what the, what even is this part? Where is this on the page? What am I doing? Having it semantically correct, it will immediately tell you where it is. And this isn't just headers and footers and articles and, and asides. This is H1s and H2s, right? Use the right header for what it is. You're only supposed to really have one H1 on a web page at a time. The header, right? One H1. What is the what is this web page? Um, but there's a whole, that that also gets into like lots of other stuff that we're not going to talk about here. But these are just some couple benefits of making sure your website is semantic. So I threw in this intermission because I realized it's a long one. It's already seven o'clock. I didn't even realize it's been this late. Um, do you guys want me to keep going? I have probably, I can blow through this next one. We're gonna talk about CSS and I can just kind of hit this up really quickly or we can pick this up next week. <laughs> Disabling Zoom on you, yeah. What do you guys wanna do? I guess we'll take a vote. We're about halfway done right now. I'm here, I'd say go. Okay. You wouldn't rush through CSS? Yeah. Well, this isn't, this is this is supposed to be a he high level. He says he would not rush through yeah. CSS. Yeah, well, this is supposed to be like a high level, right? It's nothing that's gonna be, you know, pretty in depth. So I guess, I guess if you guys want to, I'm in, I guess, so from the three people I've heard from, sure, four people, okay, we'll go for it. Cool, CSS. Great, 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 awesome. All right, CSS stands for Cascading Style Sheets. It was also developed at CERN, released in 1996, and it was aimed to improve web presentation capabilities because just looking at black and white text on the screen 
it's kind of annoying. Um, when introducing CSS though, you kind of start introducing the concept of separation of concerns. And I mentioned this earlier, right? You have your content, which is your HTML, XML, and you know, vector graphics. Um, and then you have your presentation layer, which is your CSS. And XSL was like an old variation of CSS, like a kind of like a different CSS, but it's not used anymore. And then your logic, which is your JavaScript, your Flash, and your Dart. Having those, Dart is a different language altogether. Having those three things separate allows, essentially, you can kind of think of like, if I wanted to put in different logic, I could pluck out the logic, write something new, throw it in, and it'll just work, and I don't have to touch the CSS and the HTML. Or I could bring out the HTML, put in a different HTML, and it will just work. Uh, uh, you know, assuming that like it matches up to what you wrote in your JavaScript. So the concept of separation of concerns is not just an, a web page. It's not like an HTML thing. It's like a programming thing. Separate the concerns out so you can modularize your code, pluck it out, change things out as you need to. Oh, Brian Thompson said sue oh, like four minutes ago about yeah accessibility. Yeah, they can sue you. And it was a huge thing. Who just got, someone just got sued not too long ago, I think. Um, a big company. I can't remember what it was. I was just talking about this day at work. Um, Domino's? I think Domino's was sued for accessibility. Like, yeah, or something like that. They can sue you because it's discrimination. I know it sounds crazy. It's a guarantee you. There's like accessibility lawyers out there specifically for this kind of stuff. And companies pay good money to make sure their web pages is accessible. So if that's kind of a niche thing you want to get into, learning about accessibility and kind of being that sort of um, consultant can is probably a pretty decent trade to get into. I've thought about it, but it's a lot of work to make sure that you're up on like accessibility laws. So CSS, how does it work with the browser? Well, the browser is going to load your HTML. It's going to parse your HTML. And at some point in your parsing your HTML, it's going to find your CSS, whether it's through like putting it in the tag, in a script tag. I'm sorry. Yeah, a script tag, a link, or if it's inline, or if it's a style tag in your header. It's going to load your CSS. It's going to parse it. Then it will attach the styling to your DOM nodes in the DOM tree once it's created. And then it'll display it. And this all happens you know, in milliseconds, you know, depending on how big your CSS is, I guess. Um, so the syntax for CSS, this is, um, it might be a little bit weird if you're not used to writing CSS, but I think a lot of us maybe are. Um, you have your selector and you have your declaration and your declaration is made up of its property and value. So here we're saying, I want all my H1s to have the color of blue. We're going to see more of these. So this, this, this one example, I know it might be hard to read in one line, but um, that's what it looks like. You have your selector, you have your open curly brace, you have your property, you have your colon, you have your value, and you close it with a semicolon, and then you close the whole declaration with the closing uh, curly brace. We'll see some more examples. Here's an example, right? P tag, open curly brace, your closed curly brace at the end, this is saying, I want all my paragraph tags to be blue, the color blue. I want the text in it to be center aligned. I want the font size to be 12 pixels. Um, the selectors. So here's some example of some selectors. You can directly reference the element themselves through your P tag, your H1, your span, your div. You can reference them via IDs, right? The ID attribute. Um, Brian, you mentioned that earlier, as well as classes. Um, and to, to get the element with the ID of para one for parameter one, I guess, um, you would use the, um, hashtag sign. So hashtag ID name, boom, you'll get all the elements with that ID. Same with classes, except instead of the hashtag, you use the period. Um, and side note, your IDs and classes cannot begin with a number. They can contain numbers, but they can't begin with one. So that's why I cross those out. Um, I think we're going to see some examples as we keep going. Yeah, here's an example. So you can also group selectors, right? So instead of these other ones, we kind of just said, I want all my P tags to be this. 
well, if you wanted not just your P tags, maybe you also wanted like your H1 tags to also be this same thing. Instead of rewriting this two times, you could group it. So you could say, I want my P tags, you put a comma, the next tag, comma, the nether tag, comma, maybe a class, you can keep going. You can do comma, maybe an ID, and you can say, I want them to have the same at styling, right? So you can kind of group them together and apply the same styling to a group of elements. Um, I think at this point I'm going over, what are we doing? I'm going over different kinds of selectors. All right, so I think this is the beginning of different kinds of selectors you could do. So at the top here is the example, right? Um, when you're making your selector, having an element that is sitting next to the another element, but not like with a comma, you're saying I want the all A tags in a header tag. Okay. Now you're only ever supposed to have one header on a web page. So this is going to hit up all your all your links on your header. Um, so if you look down at this example at the bottom, here's our header tag, open and closing. Can you guys see my mouse? If I move it, you can? Okay. So okay. okay, cool. So um, you have the header, you have the closing header. Um, and then here's an A tag, which is sitting just as a child of the header, like the immediate child. And then there's, we have an unordered list with A tags inside. And these A tags will also be affected because they are children of the header. Cool. So this one at the bottom here will not be will not get a text decoration of none, which by the way, that removes the, that removes the underline and a, and a tag and a link, all right? So that will not get the style. The next one are child selectors. This says, and it's represented by this greater than sign. This says only get the elements, the, <laughs> the list item elements that are direct child of the unordered list Oh, it's tiny. I don't know if I can zoom in. I should have wrote this bigger. I was, when I first, so I gave this actually, um, I gave this same, uh, uh, I guess, class like a few years ago and I put it up on a bigger screen, uh, only the mouse. And so it was a little bit bigger then. So I apologize if the text might be little. I know my mouse cursor might be little, so I'll try to move it so you guys can get an eye on it. Um, but this is, says all list item elements that are direct child of the UL element, get the A element. So this greater than sign is linking the what's to the left of it and what's to the right of it. And then get the A tag. So if you kind of read this, it's like, all right, look at all the UL elements and any one of them that has a child immediately after it, that is an LI, grab the A elements out of there and we're gonna remove the underlines. And so you can see down here at the bottom that these UL right here, has an immediate li child with a's inside and so these anchor tags will get the text decoration of none whereas below here we have an ordered list with li's and a's these will not be affected because it is not being targeted all right um we'll keep going the these are now we're kind of getting into like advanced selectors for the css getting into this is kind of like you start getting like you really aren't going to use this until you've started messing with CSS like a lot. But the plus sign says selects all the elements that are on the adjacent siblings of a specified element. So as you can see, these P tags are inside the div. They're children of the div. They will not be styled by the font size of 18 pixels because this declaration says, give me the P tags that are siblings to the div. So you can kind of think of HTML as like, parent and children and grandparent and siblings. And since these P tags sit on the same like level hierarchically, if that's even a word, as the div, it, they will be styled, but only only one of them. So like the, the next adjacent P tag to the div gets styled, not even the second one, just the first one. Does that make sense? Okay. The next one, <laughs> the general, these are getting kind of crazy. The general sibling selectors, um, it selects all the elements that are siblings of a specified element. Oh yeah, so someone linked in chat, Jude. I use this web page whenever I need a more advanced selector. Oh yeah, so I'll he linked it in chat. I could probably grab that out later and put it in the video. Um, <clears throat> so what this is doing is 
it will grab all p tags that are siblings after the sibling you're looking for. So there's a p tag above the div and there's p tags below the div. This selector says, give me all p tags that are siblings, but that have come after me. So this top p tag won't be, won't be targeted, just the bottom two. Not even the one inside, just the bottom two. All right. Um, with, a, with CSS, you can also throw in comments, like every language has the comments capability. This is what a single line comment looks like. You have the curl, you have the forward slash. Just by the way, if you ever try to remember what a forward slash and a backslash, the differences are, you can't remember the name. Imagine that the that there's a pipe standing upwards and the way it falls is the direction, is the name of the slash. So like it falls forward, so it's the forward slash. It falls backwards, so it's the backslash. It's kind of like how I remember it. So forward slash asterisk. You write your comment, you close it with a asterisk slash forward slash. So you kind of write it backwards. And if you wanted to do this over multiple lines, you can. You just do the same thing just on multiple lines. And so a lot of times it's beneficial to write comments in your code so that later on you remember what you were doing. All right, now how do we actually get the CSS into the web page once you've written it? There's a three different ways to do it. First one, inline. You put it right there on the tag. And there's a style attribute you throw in. And with that style attribute, you basically write your CSS inside. And it is right there, boom, inline. This is not good practice a lot of times because now you're mixing your CSS with your HTML and you, that's not good practice. The next thing, which is a little bit better, is, the, is your internal, which is putting your style tags in your header, like putting a style tag, and then writing your HTML in there as you would, as if it was his own file. Um, I, you'll pro, you can actually, if you inspect a lot of websites, you'll see this, but a lot of times that's injected with JavaScript. So don't think someone wrote that. And then the last one, which is the better approach is your external style sheet. So you write your CSS in a completely different file with a .css extension and you link it in your head. That's the best way to do it. Um, it is the most separate, separate of concerns, right? Um, next thing we're gonna talk about, which I think a lot of people don't really dive that much into is the cascading side of cascading style sheets and the specificity of how you specify stuff. And this is gonna come in handy when you're trying to style an element and you're like, why is this not working? I don't understand. Like I'm trying, like I'm targeting it, but my it's not changing color or whatnot. The browser will actually assign a number to each kind of specification you're doing. So inline styles are the most specific you can get, right? The What I told you not to do here, that is the most specific you can get. Um, the next one is IDs are a little bit less specific, but they're more specific than classes, attributes, pseudo classes, and then targeting the elements themselves are as least specific as you can be. And uh, this is, I'm saying the word specific a lot, but it'll make sense when actually you can see numbers assigned to them. So here, a style attribute has, this, these are the literal numbers the browsers give the styles to weight them. Um, style attribute gets a plus a thousand, IDs get plus a hundred, attributes, classes, pseudo classes gets plus 10, and element names gets plus one. Um, and I think what I have here is we're actually going to, this was a sort of like, who can tell me what the, you know, specificity of the H1 is, but I think that like, just for the sake of this, I'll just tell you it's one, um, because it's an element, right? It's just one content H1, right? So if you look at it, IDs have it, uh, that's an ID. So it has a 100 plus the element, so 101. So it's more specific than saying just H1. Um, and then you have your, this one is saying, well, we have a style tag right there. So boom, a thousand, and that, that's it. So a thousand. And then H6 with a span dot center, that's gonna be your element one, another element two with a class. So it's 12, there you go, 12, right? Now you could do this yourself. No one really does, but you can but just knowing that this exists might help you in figuring out why some styling isn't applying, even though you believe it should. Um, 
we're on the home stretch right now. So just hang in with me. Pseudo classes. Um, a pseudo class is used to define a special state of an element. For example, it can be used to style an element when you mouse over it, like with the hover effect, um, style visited and unvisited links differently, and um, whether or not an element has focus, like an input. Um, it's written like this. You have your selector, could be a class, could be an ID, could be an element, and then you have the pseudo class name, and then you just put its property value in. Use an example. So with the anchor tag, these are the four most popular anchor tags, I, um, pseudo classes you can have link, visited, hover, and active. So link is, it's unvisited, it renders to the page, you've never visited it before, it's going to render as, this is red, FF000 is red. Um, <clears throat> now, if someone's visited the link, this, you use this pseudo class and this puts it as green. And then if you hover over it with the hover pseudo class, you're gonna get purple. And if you select it, um, which is different than visited, but if you select it, like when you click on it and hold it, um, you use the active pseudo class and that makes this blue in this example. Just a heads up, if you're trying to do this for an anchor tag, have different colors for different states, you have to put them in this order, link, visited, hover, active. Otherwise, the browser won't render one of them or all of them. Like this is the order the browser needs them to be in. At least the last time I wrote this, it needed to be like that. And I'm pretty sure it hasn't changed. So to get this to get it to the work that you want, you have to have a link in the visited, then the hover, then the active. And uh, here are some examples of what you could do. Active is really good for like inputs, lets you know if you're like in the input or not. Like someone's actually in the input with their cursor. Checked for like a checkbox and then disabled hover last child as another popular one. Like you're just trying to get the last child of an element. Um, the nth child, so like not the last one, but like maybe you need the fourth one in there. So you can put a four in N, that N can be any number. It can also be an equation, uh, but we're not covering that right now. Um, required valid and such not. Um, last, I think this is the last part. Oh no, it's not the last part, almost the last part. Two things left, pseudo elements. A pseudo element is used to style specific parts of an element. So it's not, an, it's not a, it's not a state of an element, it's a part of an element. So like you wanna style the first letter or line, or you wanna in, insert content before or after. In, content before and after is probably the most popular. So like this one says, the first letter in my P tag, I want the color to be red and font size to be extra large. This will look like your typical like fairy tale book where like the very first letter is huge and the rest is like small text. That's what that will do. Um, and here are, here are what you have available to you. After, before, first letter, first line, selection. And selection is the would you like highlight the text. So you can actually style it differently when someone highlights it. Um, after and before is used a lot um, when you're trying to do some pretty advanced CSS stuff. And if you ever go on to, what is that CSS um, website where people go and they do a lot of CSS stuff for fun. I can't remember the name of it right now. Um, so they use it a lot there. Lastly, the attribute selectors. So a lot of people don't realize this, but you can, you can actually target elements based on specific attributes. Um, and so here's some examples. Hang on, I wanna make sure, don't go too far, okay. So here's some examples. So, let me just show you what it looks like. So here's, an, here's what I'm talking about. So you have the A tag and you want to target all the A tags that have the href equal to this and you want to color it green. It's pretty specific, right? Um, so to target this, you would write it like this. So any A tags with that. And here's, here's back to what it was. So that would be this right here. So like a specified attribute or a specified attribute value, which is actually what this one is, sorry. Um, or you want an attribute containing the word. So maybe instead of it saying example.org, we just care that it contains the word example, you know, and we can just say if the href has the word example, we'll use it. Um, and you can read the rest. It's pretty, it gets pretty intense. Starting with, begins with, which is different. Um, and then ends with and just contains. So 
and I guess this is the last one. Oh, that's sorry. Yeah, units. Um, here's what you can do with CSS as far as units go. Um, these are great for printing. It's not good for responsive websites. Um, you can actually use these in your CSS. Pixels are probably obviously the most used other than the relative um, units. Um, but, and then you have your relative units, which I think most people will, yeah, most people will use. It's great for responsive websites, EM, EX, CH, REM. A lot of these you're probably not gonna use. I've never used EX or CH, um, but I think I have used the rest. Um, so most popular when it comes to rel uh, responsive websites, REM, REM is used a lot. Um, and EM. So I'll just leave this up here for you to take a look at it. Um, you probably don't need to know all of them. I just threw them up here so you knew they existed. Last thing you need to know about is the box model. All right. Um, all HTML elements can be considered as boxes. In CSS, the term box model is used when talking about design and layout. Um, the CSS box model is essentially a box that wraps around every HTML element it consists of, um, margins, borders, padding, and the actual content. So I mentioned that paragraph elements get a margin by default, right, in the browser. And you can kind of see that um, content would be like what's in your P tag, and then padding would be the padding given to you by the browser. And the box model is important to understand because if you're trying to add padding and margin, and a border, you kind of need to know how it affects um, your element. And I pulled this right from W3 schools. I mean, if you can't tell by the green border, but um, so just kind of understanding that this exists and that um, there used to be a time when adding a padding in Internet Explorer rendered outside your content rather than like inside your content and so there's a lot of like argument about how to properly add padding and margin because um, they render differently. But for the most part nowadays, it's all pretty much standard. Um, padding will affect inside the element. So if you put padding in your paragraph, it'll actually, it'll actually, the whole element will keep the same width of the parent, but the what's inside the element will get scrunched just by what the padding is and then margin will actually shrink the whole element by adding a margin around the border um so this is kind of a concept we can get kind of deeper in later but i realize it's been like an hour and a half and that's the end um i threw up when i did this i threw up these links to kind of give some portfolio inspirations to people who might want to see like some pretty fun css stuff and i don't remember what they look like since when I did this. So this is this guy wrote his like this. Um, I don't know these people. I just literally just linked them from what I found. This one's pretty crazy. Like, as you can see, boom, 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 boom. Um, anyway, this one's like a little, I think it's a game. Oh, destroy this web page. I don't know. Anyway, I'll link all this stuff in, in the video, but um, that's it. That's all I have. So it was a lot of stuff. I think when I first put this together, we actually had two hour meetups as opposed to this one hour. Um, I have to keep that in mind when I go write these. But um, any questions so far? Any questions now that I'm done? And I think who am someone Najat, Najat, sorry, asked if there's a YouTube channel to watch your courses. I don't have courses. I am just putting this together for the meetup group, but I will put this video on YouTube with the last one I put up. Um, and if you have any questions, you feel free to reach out to me via meetup or, or Discord. Um, I'm actually going to stop sharing now. No, no, we'll wait for questions to be answered so we can make it in the video. Does anybody have questions? Cool. I'll stop sharing then. Not at this moment. I'll stop sharing and I will stop recording.